Hi, my name is Shania, unless you're a brand trying to be personal with me in my email while failing to actually look up what my name is, in which case I'm Shannon, and I use the pen name Shanspear here on YouTube. I hope you're having a very wonderful day. I'm not because of some people in Texas. Um, so let's have a word from our sponsor, Helix. So if you don't know what Helix is, let me explain. Helix is a premium mattress company designed to accommodate your sleep and body preferences. When I was offered a chance to work with Helix nearly six months ago, I was really excited because I was already in the process of saving up for a new mattress. I already knew the process of buying one would be like a little awkward. As someone with social anxiety, I hated the idea of going into a mattress store and laying down in front of everyone and everyone's looking at you so i knew that was out of the question i will not be subjected to such embarrassment funnily enough this made helix the perfect option for me as their buying process is 100 percent online and easy to use the first step to getting acquainted with helix was to take their helix sleep quiz they ask about your height your body type and your favorite sleep positions in order to match you with your perfect mattress you can also take the quiz with a partner or whoever else is sleeping in your bed, I guess, and find a happy medium to accommodate you both. I personally think I'm more of a soft mattress type of person. My old mattress was really firm and springy, and as someone with an assinuated chest area it was really painful to sleep on my stomach on my old mattress i have a lot less tension and pain in that area now as well as less stiffness in my shoulder and neck area i don't really know how else to say it i don't think there's a mattress alive that is this in tune with my body i even took a vacation earlier this year and the hotel bed was so incompatible that it made me miss my mattress back at home which is like the opposite expectation for a vacation but helix is just that good my back actually still hurts from that vacation i'm not gonna lie Regardless of your preferences, Helix makes every step of the buying process easy for you. The mattress shows up right to your door with free shipping, rolled up in a box, and easy to assemble. If this is something that interests you, be sure to visit helixsleep.com slash shanspear to get up to $200 off your Helix mattress, plus two free pillows. Thank you again to Helix for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to the inevitable hypocrisy of being a YouTuber. So I'm really apprehensive about making this video for two reasons. The topics I'm going to cover are relatively fresh and relatively traumatic, especially to the people who are directly affected by these events, like the celebrities I'm going to discuss, their loved ones, and the families affected by sensationalized and heavily documented violence, specifically in terms of true crime. I want to be sensitive about all of it because these conversations aren't so much about the dramatic TMC style commentary that follows in their wake but more so about real people being re-traumatized by viral tweets, memes, and documentaries that are created at their expense. And that's where my second bout of apprehension comes in. I want to highlight how harmful it can be to exploit other people's trauma for your own personal gain, or put more obnoxiously, gaining clout by sharing or referencing the public and viral violation slash death of another person. Specific to this video, I would like to talk about Takeoff, who was one third of the Migos and whom recently passed away, Megan Thee Stallion, who has been the target of relentless online abuse, Drake, who has allegedly cashed in on said abuse, and Ryan Murphy, the creator of Dahmer, Monster, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story, which if the show is anything like the title, sounds like it sucks. My apprehension comes from the fact that by making this video, I'm doing exactly what I'm critiquing others for doing. I am undeniably gaining clout, whether it be money, subscribers, or views, by talking about these controversial topics. But I think this observation can be useful. Like most of my videos, the knowledge that I participate in something that I'm critiquing aids in the understanding that these topics aren't in us versus them debate. There is no moral high ground for the most part because we're all participating in the same behavior, even you, the one watching this video. There's no self-righteous agenda here, per usual. I just want to discuss a concerning pattern I've noticed amongst all of us, not just random Twitter users. So before we begin with anything else, we need to understand clout. clout. 
Khadija Mbo did an amazing deep dive into the history of the term and its relation to capital. They state, Clout is about influence. Having the kind of influence and therefore power to influence and slash or get attention from others. Power and influence at their most basic understanding seems like things reserved for politicians or monarchies. But in the digital age, power and influence can come about through something as simple as likes, shares, and follows. In fact, clout can come to define numerous versions of power depending on the environment, from money to internet popularity to patriarchy to abuse. But let's start with social media. Social media happens to take clout to a new and oftentimes rapidly evolving level. Not only does your local government official have clout, not only does your favorite musicians or actors, but little Sally Mae down the street who bought a thousand dollar tire tread to wear as a skirt just got 5 million views on her TikTok. And she's influenced hundreds, if not thousands more to go waste their money on something chewier than a well done steak. Let me chill out. <laughs> it's not that serious. That skirt is ugly as hell though. Sally Mae has clout. Your mom? can even get clout if she posts enough on social media. It's something far more obtainable in this digital age than it arguably has ever been before. It's hard to see what power and influence on social media can do for someone's life and not want that for yourself, at least monetarily. I've noticed a pattern on apps like Twitter where when something tragically fatal happens and is caught on video, users began circulating it for likes and follows. In fact, it seems to be quite an easy way to gain clout on the internet. They put their account on private and promise people in comment sections that if you follow them, they'll either DM you the video or they'll post it for you to see. I've seen videos of amusement park tragedies horrible accidents, and most recently, graphic videos of the deceased artist Takeoff circulating on Twitter with hundreds, if not thousands of likes. And there's no telling how many times it was reshared, who has downloaded it, and who else may have been traumatized by viewing it. The one thing all of these videos have in common is that they all depict the death of another person, either as the event is happening or the direct aftermath. There is no censoring and little to no warning. Users who don't want to see these videos are inundated with it on their timelines to the point where they have to log off or start blocking people to avoid seeing it. And these videos are often shared with the same level of normalcy and indifference one would a concert clip or a TikTok recipe. I think videos like these are utilized the way they are because they inspire two aspects of our humanity that some people find hard to ignore. There's the morbid curiosity that drives people to seek out this imagery, and then there's the rush of satisfaction when others validate your post by liking it, resharing it, or following you to see more. The human need for attention is as old as time, but I think it's become exacerbated with the introduction of social media because of how social media primes us with these social interactions. Likes, shares, and follows have become symbolic of power and influence and have become an obsession among certain social media users. That's not even meant to be shade or like a drag. That's just how social media is designed. It's supposed to make you feel unhealthily attached to it. So I think the constant circulation of graphic and traumatic imagery online has led to Massive desensitization for internet users as the oversaturation of such content makes us incapable of empathetically engaging with sensitive topics. <laughs> that could have been said in fewer words. Of course, there have been moments where video evidence catalyzed entire movements, and it can certainly be said that such video evidence has the ability to hold powerful figures accountable for their wrongdoings. But in the case of showing graphic content for the sake of shock value and internet points, it becomes dehumanizing. We've discussed in past videos how wrong it is for big brands like Netflix to capitalize off of other people's grief. I think the same condemnation should be exercised for us too. I don't think any of us have the right to circulate graphic imagery of someone else's final moments. We don't have the right to exploit their death. And you know, since we're on the topic of Netflix, Ryan Murphy. I am outside your door right now. The genre of true crime has always had one foot in journalism and the other in debauched entertainment. From the murder ballads of centuries past to graphic shows like Forensic Files, 
it's becoming hard to recognize the genre for the massive potential it has in aiding victims. Most recently, Ryan Murphy, best known for his work on Glee, American Horror Story, and Pose, released a 10-episode series about Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm personally not sure how you make the switch from Glee to this, but okay. I haven't watched the series because I'm just not interested, so I can only take Google's word when it says that the series is largely told from the perspectives of Dahmer's victims. Stick a pin in that. Since its release, the show has gained a lot of clout. Wow. It became the 10th most streamed program in a single week ever recorded by Nielsen and quickly became Netflix's second most watched series ever, according to Complex. And as of recent, it has even been picked up for a second and third season and plans to follow other heinous criminals in history. So I can't get a second season of First Kill, but sure, let's make a serial killer Avenger movie. Let me clarify that the show hasn't been met with only praise. Families of the depicted victims have come forward in condemnation, people who worked on the project called it traumatizing, and people across social media have been dragging it for at least a few weeks now. Because Ryan Murphy insists that the show represents the victims and not, you know, the literal titular figure, you would think that his response to the family's comments would be empathetic. And yet, all he can do is defend his actions by saying he and his team reached out to 20 families, but didn't hear back, so they felt that they were okay with moving forward. And if you take anything from this video, take this. Silence is sometimes an answer. People like to say that because these cases are usually public information, anyone has the right to use them. And as an artist who makes a living off of talking about concepts like these, I completely understand how one might come to that conclusion. It's on the internet, it's public, it's mine to take. I also think that's a self-soothing argument an attempt to validate your own desires. These are real people who had something horrific happen to their loved ones that they have to relive every day. And not only that, they have to be re-traumatized and go through the grieving process again every time someone decides to use their names and circumstances for clout. And as I said in my true crime video, that isn't to say that this genre can't be helpful to families. I think there is massive potential, as I've stated, in getting public interest going around certain cases, especially cases that are cold or lack evidence, and that can usually help the police with tips and essentially get a fire under them to make them know that there are many, many people out there watching and hoping that they can bring someone's killer to justice. Some forms of true crime content does not really utilize that potential. Instead, they would rather profit off of the entertainment aspect of the genre. I could see if it was handled with care, if companies like Netflix actually cared about getting justice for victims, if they actually cared about their stories beyond profit, but they don't. If true crime wasn't as lucrative as it was, if millions of people weren't tuning in, companies wouldn't give a fuck about it. If anything, it would probably join First Kill in Cancellationville. And it'd probably meet her loss somewhere along the way. Mr. Aubrey Graham, model, Jamaican rapper, Rihanna enthusiast, and BBL recipient, recently released a collaborative album with 21 Savage titled Her Loss. Not only has it sparked an oversaturation of 21. Day, memes, but it's also caused yet another wave of abuse against fellow rapper Megan Thee Stallion. In July of 2020, Megan was allegedly assaulted by Tory Lanez, which ended in her requiring surgery to remove bullet fragments from her feet. She alleges that after an argument between her and Tory, she decided to leave the car that they, his security, and Megan's friend were traveling in. In response, Tory allegedly pulled a weapon, aimed at her feet, and told her to dance before firing. In October of 2020, Tori was charged with the assault. Megan states that she initially told police that she stepped on glass and that's how she got her injuries. However, she also states that was a story she told out of fear for her and Tori's life. This event happened in July of 2020, which I believe was the height of the Black Lives Matter protest against police brutality. And Megan stated that she feared what would happen if she told police that there was a loaded and previously discharged weapon in the car. Despite this, people don't believe the assault ever happened. And people, predominantly cis men, within the industry are seemingly going out of their way to side with the person who allegedly assaulted her. The baby. 
who previously collaborated with Megan Thee Stallion on numerous songs, brought Tory Lanez out on stage at Rolling Loud right after Megan's set, saying, I'll give someone in the crowd a million dollars if you can guess who is here right now. Jack Harlow, don't know why he's in this conversation, who featured Tory Lanez on a remix of What's Poppin' right before the incident, stated on the matter, I don't think I'm God. I don't have no room to judge anybody. I wasn't there when this and that happened. I don't know anything. There's three sides to every story. He's corny. And Tory himself released an entire album in September 2020, where he allegedly makes numerous references to the July 2020 incident. How the fuck you get shot in your foot? don't hit no bones or tendons. And again, I would never put you in no danger, and if I did, you would have said it when you seen the cops. The latest induction into Corny University is none other than Drake himself. On his newest album, Her Loss, he states, this bitch lie about getting shots, but she's still a stallion. She don't even get the joke, but she's still smiling. Hmm. Now look, I was an English major. I know what a double entree is. <laughs> and defending Drake by saying it's a double entendre doesn't help his case. Even though double entendres can be unintentional, what about that statement feels uncalculated to you? A double entendre refers to a phrase or a particular way of speaking that opens up the speaker's words for two types of interpretations. One interpretation would be the most obvious. Lil Yachty came to Drake's defense by stating that the line is about ass shots, which sure, I can see it. Drake doesn't say lied about getting shot. He says lied about getting shots, plural. Therefore, one interpretation of the lyric would be this distinguished young woman lied about getting a BBL, but she's still thick as hell since stallion is slang for thick woman. The other interpretation often attached to a double entendre is the more offensive, risky version. It's the one that you wouldn't admit to actually meaning because, you know, everyone on the internet will call you corny. He's corny! Well, Drake, baby, you're on the cob forever. The line, this bitch lie about getting shots, but she's still a stallion, is a double entendre because it can both refer to ass shots and the assault of Megan the Stallion. And hear me out, I think Drake knows that at his big age. Following it up with, she doesn't even get the joke, but she's still smiling, makes that pretty clear to me. Because what's the joke, Aubrey? What's funny? As you can imagine, these two lines, little grenade on fire, placed it at the tip of a flaming arrow and aimed it straight for Twitter. People are either using the opportunity to further disparage Megan Thee Stallion, like DJ Academics, corny. who stated, Meg gotta keep her beef with Tori and Tori alone, as if, She's the one who keeps bringing it up unprovoked. We not canceling Drake no matter what. You're the stallion, he's the goat, stop playing. <laughs> Someone quote tweeted it and was like, dick riding is not a form of transportation. <laughs> Others are rushing to Megan's defense, noting that this incident isn't just beef like DJ Academics implies, but is instead an act of abuse that Megan endured and is currently trying to seek justice for. Not that anyone cares what DJ Academic says, but having thousands of people accuse you of lying when it's already hard enough to speak out against your alleged abuser has to feel dehumanizing. And to constantly have other powerful people side with your alleged abuser would probably make someone shy away from ever speaking about their abuse again. This is one of many tactics abusers use to keep abuse going. The journalist Elizabeth Mendez Berry stated in the article, protect Megan Thee Stallion from Tory Lanez. The thing about gender-based violence is that the people you need to change aren't necessarily the abusers, though of course you want them to change too. It's the enablers and the spectators. In the context of hip hop, that's the people who work in the industry and turn a blind eye, or who actively make the case that some women don't deserve respect, either on record or in the flesh. The journalists who don't ask questions. And it's all the audiences who listen to the music without thinking and normalize the casual misogyny and dehumanization of women. You need regular people to care because they make the careers of these abusers possible. That actually reminds me of something Megan Thee Stallion said in an interview when she was talking about the 2020 incident. She talked about how when she came forward with these accusations against Tori that she became a villain of sorts. I don't know if people don't take it seriously because I seem strong. I wonder if it's because of the way I look. Is it because I'm not light enough? 
Is it that I'm not white enough? Am I not the shape, the height, because I'm not petite? Do I not seem like I'm worth being treated like a woman? Drake, Tory Lanez, DJ Academics, and DaBaby's PT Cruiser face ass have all in their own unique dehumanizing ways have used Megan Thee Stallion's abuse for clout. Now, this is a very controversial thing to say because if you're a random dude on twitter.com, your first response would be, but Drake sells out stadiums. He has millions of album sales. He founded rap. He he he. Shh. I'll get your bottle in a second, baby, but mommy has to finish the video first. Does anyone else have a sudden urge to vomit? Despite being relatively popular, hmm. Well, Drake's popular. Not sure we can say that about DeBogo anymore. Despite his popularity, Drake is still fully capable of using other people, even those you deem below him, for clout. Because that's how clout works. Like I said earlier, he knows what he's doing. John Kiramanaka states in a New York Times review of the album, Drake knows this will be chum, of course. It's not fan service like Taylor Swift's Easter eggs, but it reflects an understanding that for many listeners, and perhaps especially for those who may not bother listening at all, the meta narrative matters. A meta narrative means a story within a story. So the song is a story, but he's also including a reference to another story within it. He understands that constructing a narrative about something so controversial as Megan's assaults will cause commotion online. Kara Manaka continues, and yes, this is one way to measure an album's success, how much chatter it engenders. Even the marketing strategy for her loss, which featured elaborate imitations of Vogue magazine, which he's allegedly being sued for millions at the moment, by the way, and mock appearances on NPR's Tiny Desk series and the Howard Stern show, suggested an awareness of, the utility of, and disdain for the way information flows online these days. Drake is undeniably gaining clout for this controversial line. Even if you think he's more popular than Megan Thee Stallion, even if you think he's above attention seeking, chatter doesn't get sent into the void. All of this commotion isn't canceling out. And even if he's doing this as a sort of commentary to show his disdain for how information travels online, using someone else's abuse doesn't make it right. People are listening to this album, they're sharing the lyrics, they're driving up sales. But let's say none of that matters. Let's say dropping that stallion line did nothing for him. It didn't line his pockets, it didn't tuck him in at night and kiss his forehead. Even if he isn't gaining money or fame from it, he's still gaining a form of clout. As Khadija noted earlier, clout can refer to power and influence. Being a cis man, and I know I'm about to lose some of y'all, being a cis man and performing what some would call toxic masculinity under a patriarchal system, Drake is reaping hmm, what I would call cultural clout, patriarchal power even. Michael Kaufman notes that the common feature of the dominant forms of contemporary masculinity is that manhood is equated with having some sort of power. Power is seen as power over something or someone else. It's fashionable among men who subscribe to this performance of masculinity to be misogynistic. I'm not talking about all men, I'm talking about men who subscribe to that certain performance of masculinity. The cultural dominant idea of what it means to be a man. And this is especially true when it comes to black women. Malcolm X wasn't just talking to the sky when he said that the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. Drake may not be getting attention in terms of money, but he's getting attention from men who like to make other misogynistic men their god. His song has rallied a new wave of threats, judgment, memes, disbelief, and antagonism against a woman people are determined to hate. And I don't even think they hate Megan Thee Stallion because they want to support Tory Lanez or even Drake himself. Had Tory Lanez melted into oblivion some random day in 2017, nobody would be none the wiser. And judging by how Drake's last two albums went and the chatter that surrounds it on Twitter, nobody would care about him either. Men like this don't want to support Tory Lanez and Drake. They want to support what these two men in their continual harassment of Megan Thee Stallion represents power and the right to harm women. There is little to no recourse for harming women in song, in jest, or in reality, Ivy Ani notes. In some cases, there are even rewards. Daystar, which was Tory Lanez's 2020 album that further accused Megan Thee Stallion of lying, rose to number one on Apple Music on its day of release and has since become Lanez's sixth consecutive 
top 10 album on the Billboard 200. At the end of the day, I really hope Megan Thee Stallion is surrounded by love, protection, and empathy because this can't be easy. And I hope the same for everyone else who's affected by the stories I talked about today. This constant strive for attention and notoriety, as human as it can be, can also become harmful to other people when utilized for selfish reasons. Anyways, <sighs> I'm sorry for being so hypocritical in this video. I promise I'll go back to being self-righteous soon. Check out my second channel if you want. Like, comment, and subscribe for the irony. And I will see you in a couple of weeks. I love you.